So y'all get on your feet and join me tonight in, in inviting Carleen Roy to the stage. Oh my God. I know, you gotta tell them, that's what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> now, how you doing tonight? How you doing? How has it been back in town for homecoming, right? It's been a couple years, yes. you know, you got other celebrations right now as well. I'm gonna tell you guys, it's so funny. Anytime I come back to DC, I'm literally in tears. I think you posted about this earlier. It's like, it's so many emotions to like come back to Howard, to come back to DC where there's so many positive memories. It really is like your coming of age story as you hmm. go through the streets, as you pass by the restaurant. So whenever I'm here, I'm just filled with so much joy. And I had a conversation with myself today. I was like, going to Howard was literally the best thing to ever happened to me and the best decision I made at my very young 17, yeah. 18 year old self. So I love being home. It also is my AKA anniversary. That's so right. My line sisters and my hey. pro fight here is here. <laughs> so it's all the things. It's this, is AKA anniversary and just any time is being back at Howard is a big deal to me. Big deal. Now you're also from Memphis as well, I right? Am. And you were just home. How was that, right? Home is great. Anytime I go to Memphis, I'm guaranteed to gain seven pounds. I eat so <laughs> much. It's barbecue, it's soul food, it's wings, flats only. It's oh, all the I'm things. With you. Yes, I'm with it's you. All the things whenever I go home. Um, but yeah, I just was home. We did a annual empowerment event for black. Right, right, owning so. the block. Thank you. So that was super successful, but I'm happy to be here now. Wow. Now, what now? What was it about that event and creating that event and the experience, I should say, because it's much more than just an event. Um, why was that important for you to go home and do that? So uh, on top of the Vanity Group, which is my business, and we do red carpet events, there are a few events that we own and produce in-house. And owning the block is one of them. And owning the block is a career empowerment experience for young black millennials in Memphis. Um, what I realized from traveling the world, and especially living in New York, I felt like people in other cities just had a head jump mm. or a head start over me because they were exposed to so many so things that I was not exposed to. If you live in Memphis, you work at FedEx, mm. you're a nurse, maybe you're a doctor or a lawyer, any job in the 90s that you can Google, <laughs> <laughs> that would be your career choice in Memphis. And I would say, wow, I wish young black Memphians knew that other careers and other paths existed. So instead of wishing that it existed, I created it. So wow. that's what Owning the Block is. It's amazing. It's my baby project that is growing up to almost be an adolescent. And it was it's a dream come true to see it come to fruition. I love it, you know, and I, and I align with it, right? Because growing up, you know, you, we talked about it a little bit this morning, you know, um, I live in, you know, I grew up in Louisiana. Oftentimes, we didn't have exposure to the opportunities and the different career aspects and the different businesses, right, um, that I'm in love with today. And, and even the role I'm in today, I didn't even know that I can even do this back then. And so I really love that you, you've created it and especially done that at home. Um, now, thinking about home and Memphis and, and your childhood, uh, what was that like, right? Like, what you know? I think your your father was an entrepreneur. Yeah. Like, what was what was this like? Growing up in Memphis was the best thing that, on top of Howard, that ever happened to me. Um, my mom w had an amazing career, and my father was a business owner. Um, I very much grew up like the Cosby Show. Like, my <laughs> life was a different world before I even knew what a different world um, was. So I grew up in a community of black excellence with leaders, with bosses. Mm. Um, and with empowerment my whole life, very, very humble. I go home, I be wearing a fur coat and Walmart. My mom be like, what is you doing, girl? We in Memphis, <laughs> like bring it all the way down. So I always say like, no matter where I've been in the world, um, my roots are very still humble. You can hear Memphis in my voice. I don't <laughs> care what fancy stage I may, may be on the, the country Southern girl in me is lives within always. Absolutely. Now, what do you remember about seeing your, your father as an entrepreneur, right? Because um, I think, you know, he had a, a strong influence on your direction today um, in the conversations that we've had about him. Um, what do you remember about him? I remember being a young person and seeing a black man run. Hmm. That was dope to me, like to be in the 80s where we didn't have Instagram and we didn't have Google yeah. and being a black entrepreneur was something that was very much unheard of at that time. At a very young age, I saw what it is to run, hmm. to have a team of people 
to have an idea and see the idea go from very small to very big. So we talk about white privilege all the time, but there is black privilege. <laughs> and black privilege is not about money. It's not about wealth. Black privilege can be about exposure. Mm. Black privilege can be about being around educated people. Black privilege can be about the opportunity to travel, whether you travel with your cheerleading team or you travel with your church. So I've come from a community of black privilege, and I feel like we need more of that. So coming from a community of black privilege and going to Howard, which just throws gasoline on your <laughs> on biggest it. dream, yeah. it's like I graduated like I'm that bitch. Literally, that's how I felt when you graduate <laughs> because I think Howard just has that energy for anybody who goes there, my my, my personal opinion. I, I think we got a couple people in the audience that would agree uh, with yeah. you. <laughs> yes. um, now, now, speaking of that, right, like you, you, you were able to see your dad take this and grow that, um, but your your mother also had a, a very instrumental impact on you as well, right? She, she worked in the arts and, yeah. and you would get into the so arts as well. So my mom worked in the arts industry. My mom actually is an educator and she had a performing arts high school in Memphis mm -hmm. and it was great having a mother who was in the performing arts because she was with the it's right along with me. So <laughs> I would come home like, look at this um, new routine I'm about to do, and I'm going to charge y'all $5 to watch me perform in the kitchen. <laughs> and they'd be like, yes, go, girl, you amazing. So <laughs> my parents, they always fuel my wildest dreams. They really never tell me no. Hmm. Um, they let me do whatever. If I wanted to charge my neighbors $3 to do a lame routine I've been doing for the past six weeks, like they were okay with it. So hmm. I felt a lot of freedom Growing, growing up, up and I think that's because I had my mom who was very artistic and then my dad even though he's a businessman and with businessman it's like if you don't make dollars it don't make sense but he was a dreamer mm. so I had the best of both worlds did any of that seem unusual to you like when you thought about some of your friends growing up like what were not at all everybody in my community growing up somebody's parents or somebody's family was Somebody, one of my hmm. closest girlfriends, her parents owned 27 McDonald's, 27 um, McDonald's in our hometown. Or my neighbor, they were basically the T.D. Jakes of <laughs> Memphis. Or <laughs> this person over here is the Johnny Cochran of Memphis. Like, I really grew up in a place of black excellence. So because of that, I think my lens on the world is, why can't you do it? Right. Why can't I've you do it? I've seen everybody yeah. else do it. I think that has made me a bit fearless. I don't mm. know if that's to my detriment, but I saw people do it at an early age, and I always say, if you never seen somebody do it, you don't know you don't that know. you can't do it. So I was grateful enough to come from a community where people were on their and I was able to see it and just be groomed from it. You never know that God is grooming you hmm. when he is grooming hmm. you. I never had a dream of being an entrepreneur or a business owner. I don't even know how to like check my account balance <laughs> online. Like I can't do all of these things, but I think that God is usually like, preparing us and we don't even know it. It, it always seems to, to work its way out. I mean, I think one of the things that was interesting that you share, which is super important, which is why we're, we're doing the work we're doing tonight, is, is you saw a lot of these things growing up so that when you're stepping into your powers, it doesn't seem abnormal to you. It just seems like what you should be doing in the first place. <laughs> Did you ever have like this pressure where you felt like you had to perform because your parents, um, were, were performing at a certain level in their respective places in their careers? Did you ever feel like you're like, I need to you know, perform at this certain level? I never felt like that. And I would say in my life, I've always been the average C student. I never got straight A's. My parents never cared about that. But I think there's an old saying go, if you have the vision, you can hire the intellect. Mm. Um, so my parents were okay with me just being and being a child that's the school of the world. Mm -hmm. So I never felt pressure to perform. I will say, though, that when I graduated from Howard, I felt pressure to do something. <laughs> Everybody at Howard is graduating doing something. I'm going to work at Goldman Sachs, or I'm going to work at Ford, or this company did this internship with the School of Business, so this is what I'm doing, and I did not have a job or any opportunities. And that's what I mean by Howard is a school of competitive spirit. It's like mm. all your peers are doing are things, doing so something. you want to do it too. So I didn't feel the pressure to perform in my coming of age, but graduating from Howard, I definitely felt the pressure like, oh, I need to do something. Yeah. And I definitely want to get into that because you definitely did something, some things. <laughs> um, but, but, but before we get into that, um, what did you, what did you first want to, want to be? What did you first aspire to become? I have a few things. Hmm. And my father, a very wise businessman always says, you're going to go through seven jobs before you figure out what your career is. Hmm. So it's okay to take a journey and figure it out. 
I at first wanted to be a hairstylist because <laughs> my grandmother was a hairstylist. Then I had a terrible acne problem when I was an adolescent and my mom took me to the dermatologist. I never knew what a dermatologist was. And so in my little 12 year old self, I asked this woman, I said, what are you? Like, what kind of doctor are you? And she was trying to relate to me as a young, as a young kid. And she said, I make people feel beautiful. Hmm. I said, well, that's it. That's what I'm doing for the rest <laughs> of my life. I make people feel beautiful. I was that impressionable. So I thought I wanted to be a dermatologist. Hmm. Um, and I got to Howard and majored in biology. And I either failed my first biology class or I didn't even get through the first one. I said, well, this is, the biology is a wrap for me. Um, so I was figuring it out yeah. for a long time. Um, now that I am at my big age, I actually think it's so crazy to ask a 17, 18, 19-year-old child to decide right now right. what you want to major in, and this is going to be the job for the rest of, of your life. life. I think it's unfair because you haven't lived. Hmm. You haven't traveled, you haven't met other people. So how do you know what you want to do when mm. you haven't lived and failed mm. and succeeded and bumped your head mm. and got in trouble and figured it out? Like, I think you really need to, you don't know it then, but you have to give ourselves grace to figure it out. Yeah. So I want it to be a lot of things just because I didn't know. And that's the beauty of being young. You can just dream and do whatever you want to do. Dream and do whatever you want. And I think it's important what you said there is that Whatever you decided then doesn't always have to be what you go with next year. We don't year know that. We don't. We think like our the, the decision is finite. Our, <laughs> our college counselors and whoever your advisor are in college, they're not telling you, pick a major, but you, you can create whatever life you want to create. Mm -hmm. It's like, I major in this, so this is what my life is going to be. And it's like, we evolve in thought. We evolve hmm. as people. And it's like, actually, I want to do something different, and that's okay. It's completely different, right? And if you think about what you're doing right now, is that using the degree that you actually went to? <laughs> actually not. I think my degree that I'm using right now is a degree of Howard University, hmm. which is Speak on getting that. done, which is figuring a way when you don't have a way, which is walking in the room and feeling like you're that girl or you're that dude and your life is your one runway. I think that the spirit of Howard is completely my lens of hmm. how I see the world. So my degree in sociology and my minor in PR, absolutely not, which is the trade I went to school <laughs> for. But the school of black excellence and walking the walk and talking the talk a thousand percent. And that is because of Howard. Did you always want to go to Howard? Did you always yes. know that's what that was where you were my parents go? went to HBCUs. Okay. So that's all I knew. It's like you go to college, you go to HBCU. Both of my parents are Greek. So like I said, like my life was the Cosby show and different <laughs> world that. growing <laughs> up. Um, I not to age myself for the young people in here, but I was watching Team Summit. That was the original TRL. Yes, it was. Like, you don't even got TRL right now. No, we don't have TRL. So don't have any of things maybe anymore. Maybe it's the don't original Carisha, please. I don't know. <laughs> but all that to say, Teen Summit did a episode. Teen Summit was like the hip teen show on BET. And Teen Summit did a Howard Homecoming takeover where they were at the yard reporting live for Howard University. Mm -hmm. I'm probably in the eighth grade. I'm like, yo, this is the most lit thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I remember turning to my dad and was like, whatever this is, again, I'm so impressionable. Whatever this is, it's a movie, please sign me up. And I remember <laughs> my dad, he like researched where Howard University was and he wrote a letter to the school like my 13 year old daughter loves the school. Oh, so every year, one. no, he was into it. And every year I was getting literature from Howard, brochures and hmm. things like that. So my mind was off that one episode, I was like, my mind is completely made up. So the power of influence is actually a real thing. Wow. And so what was the experience like for you? Because you speak so, so highly of and so passionately about it. Um, what do you take away from your education at Howard? What do I take away from my education at Howard? I think if you have the opportunity to go to an HBCU, and I think that going to college and being at an HBCU is the only time in our life where we're going to be surrounded by excellent, educated people of color, from your professors to your peers to the people on your cheerleading team with, to your sorority sister, sisters. That is the only time in our life where we can be surrounded by us and be filled with us and be given our flowers. So my experience at Howard just left me so empowered that I thought that I could do anything. 
And they talk about Howard is the black Harvard, but it's like, actually, we don't need Harvard don't to need make us pop Mm-mm. off. It's like, we are what we are, mm-hmm. and we are dope. And Howard builds leaders for the global community. Mm-hmm. So that's why we don't know who went to Howard. I mean, Hampton, but we know everybody that went to Howard. Like, we just keep <laughs> kicking out winners, <laughs> kicking out winners. So I'm happy to be in the family of excellent alumni who've yeah. gone to Howard. So. I mean, y'all have excellent alumni. We, we've been meeting a lot of them this week. Yeah. We met a lot of them I'm earlier today. I'm surprised why they ain't got me on a popping alumni list. I need to speak to... Oh, we need to speak to, to somebody. Yeah, to the president. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, did you, after you started to finish school, you, 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 you talked about it a little bit earlier, but you felt like you had this pressure to, to figure out what you wanted to, to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you kind of said you didn't really have something specific lined up. Mm-hmm. Um, so what did you do? Like, what did you, where did that path take you? I was a super senior at Howard. Is anybody, are anybody here Howard students? <laughs> yes? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Is the iLab still around? Okay, <laughs> so I was at Howard when our iLab first was built, and we thought it was the most popping thing. We said, oh, iMax, computers, a printer? Like, it was I'm like, in. might as well have been the Apple store. So. <laughs> um, and I was in the um, iLab one day, and Shalonda, I don't know if you remember this, and on the iLab, they used to just play the most ridiculous things, like after-hours videos, <laughs> just all ridiculousness. And one day, they were playing Sex in the City, um, in the iLab, and I was fake studying because I was a CD student at, at most, and I was with my line sister, and on the TV screen was Sex in the City was playing, and it was on mute, but I just saw this woman, mm-hmm. and she looked powerful, and she looked classy, and she looked funny, and her clothes was fly, mm-hmm. and I turned to my line sister like, what is the show? What mm-hmm. is, what's happening? She's like, oh, it's Sex in the City, and this woman, Samantha, she's a publicist, mm-hmm. Again, that's it. I'm changing, I'm my, changing major my major tomorrow <laughs> to public relations. Like, that's how impressionable <laughs> I was. And I went and changed my major the next day to PR. Yo, you don't waste any no, time. I waste no time. I, I, get, I get to the bag. You get to the bag. I call my dad, like, I'm spending another year in school. He said, who, who going to pay for it? <laughs> you know, the way my account is set up. Um, so I stayed an extra year in school because I was like, this seems exciting mm. to me. It seems like a fun lot, a fun life. I never heard of public relations or what a publicist was. So that is what got me to barely got me to graduation. <laughs> so you <laughs> barely got you to graduation, but you did get to graduation. I, get, I got there. I was trying to host my teacher, like, bro, if you just give me a C, my mama and grandmama can come see me they graduate, can come see please. Me. Yes, I was. <laughs> I was always trying to finagle I, I line with you on that. It, it, the one thing was I needed to get out of school so my mom yes, could see me. Yes, my grandmother could right, see me, yes. Right? <laughs> uh, so you, you get out, and then what's what's the plan? Did you did you go for a job, or did you get a little creative and kind of make something up? The plan was to go into public relations because mm-hmm. it looks so easy to the <laughs> woman on, on TV. TV. Yeah. So I applied to every PR company agency there is, hospital PR, entertainment PR, um, agency PR, business, like I applied for everything. I got zero jobs, zero. Nobody called me back. How are you feeling you know, about I that? I was ghosted. I felt defeated hmm. because my friends and my peers had jobs and they were, you know, graduated and they had things lined up and I had nothing lined up. And during the time after graduation, I happened to go to New York and I met a young woman who was a publicity assistant at Def Jam. Hmm. And again, I was like, I need your life. This is the <laughs> coolest thing ever, um, and she worked in PR in the music business, and Hmm. I was like, I love this, I love everything about what you're doing, like, put me on, and she was like, well, we're not hiring, but you can be my unpaid intern, but at Def Jam, we don't take interns who are college graduates, so what you're going to have to do is basically sneak in the building every day, sneak in as a visitor, (laughs) wear a visitor (laughs) pass, yes. Wait, you were sneaking in the building? Basically, it's like you come in like you're fake coming to like see someone like, oh, I'm here to see Bima, and then you just don't ever leave. <laughs> so that was my that was my everyday <laughs> life and job for probably nine to twelve months. Um, so she's like, I can't put you on, but if you're in the building, people will see you, and hmm. whenever it goes, it goes. My parents thought I was crazy. Hmm. My very southern parents like, don't move to New York. They're I done watched Law and Order. They're mm. gonna kill you on the subway. <laughs> All, all these things. I'm like, I'm going. Just fearless and young. And I packed up my U-Haul truck, and I moved to New York, and I crashed on a friend's couch, and my mom would secretly send me money, and that's my 
early years of living in, in New, New York. York. Mm -hmm. Now, did you know anything about New York other than that first time you? I went? didn't. I I would come maybe like do an internship over the summer, but I was very much a fish out of water. Hmm. Had I moved moved to New York from Memphis, I would have had complete culture shock. Wow. But the footstep of being in D.C. was a great buffer for me because that was my first time experiencing city life and mm. things like that. So yeah, my first nine to 12 months being a college graduate from the illustrious Howard University, y'all know how proud we are at Howard. We <laughs> think we can do anything. <laughs> I was an unpaid intern just hoping to get in where I fit in. Mm. What was the experience like? What did you what did you pick up on? Because I got to imagine if you're there and you're, you're willing to sleep, sleep on the, the couch, then you're willing to probably learn as much as you can while you're in that in that building surrounded by a lot of different, probably really great professionals yes. right so tell me what did you start to get into what did you start to gravitate towards I one I was excited to be an intern um, as someone who hires people every day I have a full staff I don't see the excitement to work and it sounds crazy it's like who wants to be excited mm. to work but I was very eager to work I was very eager for the opportunity. It's like, Ludacris need a do-rag. I'm like, I'll go get it. I was just so <laughs> excited. Or we need cupcakes for LL Cool J's birthday. Like, whatever was happening, I was so excited to do it because I realized it was an opportunity that was going to set off um, the rest of my career. So, one, I was very excited. Um, two, what did I gravitate to? I gravitated to people. Mm. Um, people easily liked me. Um, and I think it's a very powerful thing to just be a cool person, hmm. like not hmm. be weird. Like, I think people liked me. I'm serious. Like, I think people liked me because I was eager and I would be willing to do what everybody you were else hungry. didn't want to do. do. Right. Hmm. I was like, I'm going to be there early before my boss's boss and hmm. I'm going to leave after. No one wants to take the X, Y to this. Like, I'm going to do it. I remember walking one day in the rain literally to get like birthday cupcakes for some rapper who was signed to Def Jam, but I was just, my shoe was breaking, a rain, my leave out was frizzing up, like all the things, but I was just so excited um, to do it. So I was happy to work, and I think I realized at a very early age that this is the start of whatever my career is going to be. Hmm. As a dancer, and we talk about my mom being in performing arts, as a dancer and anyone who's ever performed, they always say, you got 10 seconds to wow people. Mm. And if you don't wow people after the first 10 seconds, it's like, get off the stage, please. Like, I am bored. Like Showtime at the Apollo. Yeah, literally. <laughs> so I realized, I think, at an early age, like, the power of, like, presence mm -hmm. and how you show up in your first impression with people. Wow. So you, you go through this experience. You're at Def Jam. You, you said it was about 12 months that you were yes. unpaid. Um, and, you know, at some point in your career, you also ended up going to work with Diddy, mm -hmm. right? Um, what was the, the transition from Def Jam to working with Diddy? I was an intern at Def Jam, and a gentleman I met at Def Jam who was an executive in the marketing department, he was like, yo, you like the world's best intern. You just be doing all the things that no one wants <laughs> to do. He said, I just discovered this new artist, and when we pop off, I would love to hire you to come work with us. I'm like, please sign me up. I would love the opportunity. And the artist at that time was Neo. I think Neo, Rihanna, hmm. and Young Jeezy all got signed like the same day. So this guy actually quit his job to manage Neo full time, and they hired me as their first assistant. I got fired about three, four times, but wait, that's, that's another wait, story for did? another day. <laughs> okay, okay. I was just young and just like was making sloppy, sloppy, sloppy mistakes. So left Def Jam. I had the opportunity to work with Neo's team. Um, then my dad, always in the back of my head, like, are they, do you got insurance? Do you got a business card? <laughs> they paying you cash at the end of the week? This is Fugazi. So <laughs> my dad was in the back of my head, and I was thinking, like, oh, I need something a bit more buttoned up. And hmm. I went to work at Sony Music in the copyright department. <laughs> um, but that was a little slow for me. Mm. Um, and me just being the yeah, yeah. hustler, finagler mm -hmm. that I am, um, I met someone at Violator Management, and for any young people in the room, Violator Management is probably the original rock nation. They managed hmm. everybody who was everybody. It was a management company. It was a record label. And I would work at Sony Music during the day, and I would leave there at like 5, 6 o'clock, and then work at Violator Management. You was really hustling. I was just, I was just so eager for an experience. I think my first, my first assignment at Violator Management was typing up the itinerary 
for Missy Elliott's dancers. <laughs> it was like 50, 11 dancers. It was so <laughs> many dancers. <laughs> but I was just so excited that I played a small part in the tour itineraries for her dancers. Mm. So it was me being there, and I never got a job there. <laughs> and Chris Lighty, um, God rest his soul, Chris was like, listen, I can't hire you. The budget is a wrap over here. <laughs> but um, there is an opportunity at Bad Boy, and mm. that is how I got in the door at Bad Boy because Chris Lighty was managing Puff at that time. Now, one of the things that's interesting about your journey is you're making a you know, network as you go along. You're meeting people. You're staying connected with them. How important is that along the journey? It's important. The majority of the people that I met as an intern at Def Jam are people who are now my mentors people who are my biggest champions, people who have become my clients and have hired me from work. So relationships are everything. And someone great told me a long time ago, anybody you meet once, say their number, say their email, because chances are you're going to meet them mm -hmm. again in life. And you always want to be able mm -hmm. to reference where you met this person. So relationships are anything. And I guess that's a little bit of my PR background. I guess my major went to good use someplace, <laughs> but the power of relationships is everything. For the Vanny Group, we suck at marketing. We, our Instagram has been down for two years, so if there are any social media managers in here, please let me know. They got a couple in the room. But we <laughs> haven't posted on our Instagram in two years, mm. and we still have been booked and busy and blessed. It's because the power of relationships and staying in touch with people and People know that you get busy whether you talk about it or not. Or not, right? And and, and also it's, it's issue of the quality of your work, right? Like like I said, the perception precedes itself. Um, now you know when I think of Diddy, you know I uh, I, I get inspired because I, I love a lot of what I've seen of his journey. I don't know Diddy personally, but what I've seen um, specifically, I always love the video on the, the Von Dutch shirt, and you know you know <laughs> you know that that video. Um, what did you learn in that environment working? you know, so close with someone operating at such a high vibration? Working for Puffs, I have so many, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. Going to Howard <laughs> was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Being an Alpha Chapter, AKA is the best thing that ever happened to me. And I would say working for Puff just poured gasoline on my biggest dreams because I saw a young black man running. Mm -hmm. He was running, Puff was brilliant. He was a marketer mm. in the back of his mind. He was an entertainer. I was blessed to be in every room Puff had ever been in. I don't wow. care if we were meeting with Steve Jobs or we were meeting with Anna Wintour or we were meeting with the chairman of Estee Lauder. Because I was his executive assistant, I was in that. every room that he was in just sponging up everything, sponging up everything. Wow. And Puff is just not an artist. He's a businessman. Mm -hmm. He's a mogul. So... The meetings and the type of conversations he is into is just like mind blowing what he always has bubbling. So that experience, again, it's like I, I heard this quote once that said, the wilderness is not punishment, it's preparation. Whew. So the <laughs> whole time I worked at Bad Boy, I was like, M Mr. Combs is so tough on me. Like he don't let up. Like I can't make a mistake. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And I, a lot of times I just felt like. I was on Survivor the whole time, <laughs> but I realized it was preparing me to be my More. own boss. So mm -hmm. the, and I never had a dreams of being an entrepreneur, but seeing someone so brilliant that always was himself, no matter what room that he walked into, he always understood to read the room. Mm. But I saw someone come in and not have to code switch. <laughs> I saw someone who could come in and be fly and out iced out and swag and not feel like oh, I need to put on a suit mm -hmm. to have this meeting. It's like, no, I'm coming in as Sean Combs, and y'all going to deal with this. <laughs> and so that experience, again, like shaped my lens on life, on how I show up now as a boss myself. Now, how do you go from working with Diddy, wanting to be a publicist, wanting to be a dermatologist, to, to owning Are your you own Are you judging me I'm, right I'm, now? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm never <laughs> judging you. I am, I, am the, I am the other opposite okay. of you. Not the opposite, maybe a compliment of you of jumping around. <laughs> but, um, and, and also, I think it's wonderful to have those different experiences because you don't know what you don't want to do if you never go through multiple experiences, right? Um, so when did you get to the place where the vanity group was starting to be born? When did you decide like and maybe you didn't yeah. decide maybe you just like you kind of I get this question a lot so at bad boy I was Sean Combs executive assistant so if anyone has seen like the double wears Prada 
So when you are a high level assistant, you do everything. You do the scheduling, you do the meetings, you do the travel, you arrange like the social things. Like you are basically the right hand to the chairman and everybody has to go through you. And on top of everything that I did, a big part of my job was organizing the events that mm. Puff would do. So, or being the, we would call it the, ch the chairman synergy person. So the person who gets everybody aligned. So where the Puff was getting his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Wow. Or Jane and Beyonce are coming to the Hamptons in five minutes and I need someone to like get the house in or order and um, organize the most amazing barbecue. <laughs> or Justin is having a sweet 16 for MTV and Carlene, you need to help get things like off the ground. I really love that part mm. of my job. I'm like, this is actually cool. Like I love organizing things and I actually got a thrill out of doing things last minute. Um, and then I got to a point when I was probably a bad boy, maybe six, seven years. And I got to a point where I started to feel uncomfortable, hmm. not uncomfortable because I was unhappy. I just felt like my skin was starting to stretch. If you guys have ever lived in an apartment, you get to a certain <laughs> place like this apartment kind of small mm -hmm. or I need a two bedroom or this car is weird. It's not that you don't love your house. It's, it's not that you don't love your car. You're just starting to outgrow it. Mm -hmm. a little bit and when you work at bad boy it's kind of like kiss your family goodbye or you're going to the navy mm -hmm. um i realized <laughs> that i wanted to do something different i didn't know what exactly it was mm -hmm. but i realized that i had to go to grow mm. there's no way that i could work for puff and me and bj had a moment earlier it's like you can't work for him and like interview with somebody at your lunch right. break ain't no lunch happen. break no ain't there's no lunch break lunch you're break. always on you're always on i was like i would never be able to like entertain other jobs and I really wasn't in that mindset but I was in the mindset of okay I'm reaching my expiration date I don't know what I want to do but I'm going to take a chance on Carlene figuring it out mm -hmm. so during that figuring it out stage I would have like one foot in and one foot out <laughs> one foot in as far as like I'll interview at other record labels or I'll interview to work with other celebrities and be their assistant or a chief of staff and on the side, people were asking me to organize events for them. Hmm. Can you fly to Central Pay tomorrow and do an event? Come or on. we need to be at the Cannes Film Festival and we need to organize a party on a yacht. And these are high profile celebrities mm -hmm. that were doing it. And after a few years, I want to say shout out to my line sisters because they are a big part of my story. Tamika, who works with me, and she said, you hustling, but this actually is a business, hmm. and you should take it seriously. And I was like, you think so? Somebody got to let you know. She did. <laughs> I, I was like, you think so? And she was like, I know so. So we concocted this fake idea to throw a launch event <laughs> for the Vanity Group. <laughs> we planned a whole launch event, and basically was like telling the world that like I'm now like officially like a business owner. And since that moment, it has completely just popped all the way off, hmm. and it's been nine years. And it's a testament to wow. if you build it, it will come. And if you treat your business like a side hustle, so will everybody else. Hmm. So we need to tighten up on how we position ourselves so that you get the respect you want and you show up like the human that you want to be. Now, I got to say one thing. You kind of sped past that nine years like it was a small thing. That's no small thing. It's feat. not a small thing. It's not a small thing at all. So I, 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 y'all need to make some noise for that. Because she's going yes. on 10 years. That's yes. a decade. Um, now, now, tell me about... When you switch the mindset from the hustle, side hustle, to to fully being in it, right? That's a that's a whole mindset shift, right? Like you're really changing your life there. Um, what was it like getting that first client? What did it feel like to finally land that client? The first client felt like it's real. Hmm. People see me. It's almost like imagine if you have a local bakery and ain't nobody coming in your bakery and then finally <laughs> someone stops saying to buy a cupcake. You're like, oh, let me get the cupcake together. It's so exciting. <laughs> That's how I felt because it's like it's different when you're just like one foot in, one foot out. But getting my first client and doing our first event and it going off without a hitch, it actually affirmed that mm. I was doing the right the thing. Right and thing. it wasn't a big event. It wasn't a big project. It wasn't a huge budget it actually was with fabulous and i feel like he paid me in cash like i went to the studio like <laughs> i need twenty thousand. i don't know i was just eyeballing and figuring it out but it affirmed that i was on the right path yeah and, and sometimes you, all we need is affirmation sometimes all we need is uh, you get the first one mm -hmm. 
right? And it just puts you on the path to keep going. It gives you the confidence that you need. Um, did you have any help on that first one? Like, how are you going about it? Oh, we was a straight friends and family lots of operation. <laughs> like, anybody who could help and pull up, it was like, you're hired. So <laughs> I didn't have a full staff by then. It was friends helping me, and I would be paying them cash. You know, this mm-hmm. was before Venmo and Cash App. Like, I yeah. really had community of people who would help me when I needed to be helped. I didn't get my full-time staff where we are running payroll and W-2s and, you know, workers' comp insurance to maybe, like, six years in. Mm-hmm. So it's okay to get there whenever you get there. Right, and, and and everybody's journey is different, right? And you can't be spending your whole career looking to see what somebody else doing, saying, I might, might be doing it right. We got to go on our own journey, and we get there where we get there. You know, I, six years is impressive, though. You know, Thank like, you. that's a that's a great hustle, right? Yeah, you get comfortable. Thank we going we, we, we to chill for a bit. Where's um, the wine from my Howard alumni? Oh. Hmm. I'm, jo- I'm joking. I'm joking. Hmm. They hmm. said they're going to send me a case. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, now, now you're going to get some wine. We're really going to bring that wine up here. Um, now, w- one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, start, starting a business, uh, especially coming into this business from where you were, um, you didn't necessarily have the receipts under your business name right. that showed, like, what you could accomplish. Now, you, you obviously had the expertise and you had the hustle. But for some of our entrepreneurs here that are going to start these businesses and they may not have, like, the portfolio to show, how do you go about convincing somebody without receipts that you're the one to get this done? You don't. Hmm. You're not getting a big client or a big job or your first big nothing without receipts. Mm. Your receipts is your brand reputation. The receipts are the work that you're done. Like, you're not going to be hired. You're not going to get signed to be a rapper if ain't nobody heard you rap. <laughs> you're not going to open up the best um, hamburger spot in town if ain't nobody ate your hamburgers. Mm. You actually have to do the work, get under the tutelage of somebody to learn and understand. Like, I, I meet people all the time that say, like, I'm a brand expert, and I'm like, what brands have you worked with? (laughs) What campaigns have you been part of? What meetings have you been privy to be in? You just make it up as you go. And a lot of people are making up careers, and you see the phony people very soon because when the rubber meets the road, Mm -hmm. you see the people who are built for tough, who actually have the receipts, and the people who don't. So I don't think you are getting nothing without (laughs) receipts. And your brand is not the fly pictures you take on Instagram. <laughs> you know, your your brand is the reputation of what people say about you when you ain't in the room. Mm. Yo, Carlene is nuts, but she gonna get the job done. <laughs> that's my brand reputation, not she takes cute photos. That mm. means nothing, that's not a transaction, mm-hmm. that's no value, like yeah, that's cute and brand identity is important, but your brand is your reputation. It's reputation, right? It's, it's, it's and it's so funny you say that because a lot of people it, it, they think it's the photos, they think it's the logos, and it's like no, it's what what are you known for? Yeah. If if I gotta say one thing about Carlene, you know what am I going to say? And that's important to really think about. Like yes, the everything else helps, but you gotta start with the intent and the purpose and the quality first. Yeah. Right. Now when you think about your experiences and and the experiences that you put on to date, um, it's probably a hard question to, to answer, but I, I'm curious to know. Um, what sticks out to you, you know, that comes top of mind? Like, that's like maybe one of your favorite experiences. And it doesn't have to be your favorite because it was great. It could be your favorite because it was challenging and a bunch of went wrong. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a page out of your book and the conversation we had. I think of, and I get this question all the time, like, what's your best event or your most ridiculous event? I'm like, one day I'm going to write a book and y'all going to see all about it. But I think of events and experiences and seasons. Hmm. And because I'm at in D.C. for Howard Homecoming. I'm going to say one of my favorite events was we did an event at the African American Museum of History and Culture, Mm. maybe like less than a year after it opened, and it was for a beauty brand that was owned by L'Oreal. And to be at Howard, I mean, to be back in D.C. at this historic museum. Uh Uh-huh. I told you. Shout out to Lola. (laughs) <laughs> it's the efficiency for me <laughs> um, so to be at NBC doing a beautiful event at the African American Museum of History and Culture where we were getting 
so many praises. They were like, is this part of the museum? We're like, no, this is, we're tearing this down at the end of the night. But the quality and beauty was so dope that the actual curators thought it was a new exhibit opening. So that was a proud <laughs> moment for me. Anything that's rooted in culture, anything that's rooted in us is just, uh, it's always a favorite for me. It's always, a, I, I love that. And, and uh, I got to come to one of your events. You, you have know. to. You I VIP to now. I, I hope so. You VIP now. I don't want to be waiting at the door. No, no, we got you. <laughs> I'm about to hire Lola. Lola's going to get you at the door. <laughs> Let me tell you now, Lola Lola is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, now, a couple months ago, there was a, um, there's a statement that went out by a certain socialite, um, that last name Kardashian. <laughs> and um, she said, people don't want to work anymore. And you strike me as a person that um, that's a value for you. Hard work is a value for you. Um, showing up is a value for you, going above and beyond. Um, do you feel there's truth to that statement? Do you feel like things have changed generationally? Um, social media maybe has had an impact on that. How do you feel about that? I think what she said was, get off your and work. <laughs> and I think because she comes from a place of privilege that that bruised people. Because we were like, how can you tell us get off our ass and work when you have been handed a very beautiful life? Mm -hmm. I personally am a, a fan of Kim Kardashian because I think anybody turns something and nothing to something, no matter what the nothing is, but I think there's a story of just figuring it out. <laughs> um, and, you know, everybody has their own story, but I think the get off your ass and work stung people, myself included, but the statement of people don't want to work anymore, I have to agree with that. Hmm. I think Instagram has made our culture and community seem like obtaining success or obtaining receipts is so easy to get because when we look online, we see everybody's highlights. I'm going to post about owning the block and me getting the key to the city of Memphis. <laughs> I'm going to post about me being here. I'm going to post about me being with whoever celebrity I'm being with. I'm necessarily not going to post about when we're waiting for a wire and we can't make payroll this week mm. because a client has said they was going to pay us a net 30 and it's net 60 it's and we're waiting for the cash flow. Mm. I'm necessarily not going to post about my last three employees who just up and quit or mm. an employee who stole from me. It's like, we don't want to hear those stories <laughs> on Instagram. We want to hear the happy stories. And think about anybody you've seen on Instagram posting some sad shit. You be on your group chat like, oh, you see Carlene? She on some sad shit. Broke up with her man. Or, things is crazy. <laughs> we don't want to hear about <laughs> bad things. Yeah. Think about anybody you've seen that's posting something like drab. You're like, honey, take a seat. I don't want to hear this. Hmm. So we are trained to now hear the good and the highlight, which I think makes people think that success and reaching or getting to your dreams is so easy to do. And it's kind of like gone over work ethic. That's why I think the power of storytelling is so important and caption writing. If you guys follow me on Instagram, I write very long captions because I feel like the storytelling is just as powerful as your fly picture that you post. So yes, I do think a lot of people don't want to work but I think it's not just them. I feel like it's what we are seeing day in and day out, sensory overload of everybody winning, 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 mm. that you think that it's so easy to win yourself. Hmm. Well, I know you can't make magic happen, but you know, if you, if you could have an influence, as I, I think you do through your platform, like when I see your stories and, and, and also to your captions, I love long captions because I love the intent and love knowing more about past the picture, right? Because the picture doesn't tell everything. Um, but if you were wanting to see a shift, what would that shift look like? How do you imagine we start to shift things in a different direction where there is a balance, right? Because I'm also, you know, a little bit critical on, on my millennial generation as well, where I feel like we're on the, op you know, we're on the, uh, the hard extreme of like, you know, you know, working all these crazy hours. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how do we get to a place where maybe it's a little bit more balanced, but it also is like hard work is sometimes just hard work and that's okay. Being in the room, in your community, like, it's, I get my nails done at this place, and they hate people that's over 40. They be like, over 40, oh, my God, that's so old. Like, this is, like, <laughs> the thing anytime I go to the nail salon. But it's like, you get so much free game by being by people who have already walked the walk hmm. and talked the talk. Hmm. 
So when we talk about how do we get over just thinking success is an overnight thing, I think it's about community mm. and surrounding yourself with your OGs. They're going to keep it completely real and honest with you and tell you when you're messing up mm. or tell you when you need to do something differently or help you negotiate that next job. So I think it is community and storytelling that will probably help us shift people to really tapping back into um, work ethic versus pretty pictures on Instagram. Yeah, we, we have to. We have to see that. We have to talk to other people and have a different perspective, right? Because it isn't always the glossy stuff that, that you see. Um, and, and people start to get that when they start to get in the weeds of things, right? Um, now, I have one last question before we take some questions from the audience tonight. Um, we have a lot of folks here that want to start businesses or are currently in businesses. And you've been in business for 10 years, going on 10 years now, a whole decade. Um, what's one piece of advice that you would offer to folks starting businesses, starting small businesses? Remember that the journey of entrepreneurship is a slow bake. It's not a microwave. <laughs> Almost, it almost is the, the crock pot. The <laughs> crock pot, you put the food in in the morning, and maybe it's done by the time you get home from work. It's maybe. not an instant zap thing. So if you're going to be a business owner and you really are passionate about that life, realize that it is a marathon, it's a journey. It's going to be some days when you up, my money bag, y'all, I'm spending money, uh, it's, it's up. And it's going to be some days you're like, woo, the way my account is set up. <laughs> it's going to be some days when you have the best clients in the world. And you're going to have some days where you want to break up with your clients. Hmm. It's going to be some days where you win this amazing pitch from a brand. And it's going to be some days where 18 brands tell you no. Hmm. And you still have to be able to be mindful that you are on the right path and not give up because someone else doesn't see your worth. Because if you see it, and I always say this, if you f*** with you, you don't need no one else to f*** with you. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have that mindset, you're in it for the long call and willing to play the long game. Carlene, that was beautiful. Like, Thank I you. literally was just talking about that this week was about you just got to see you first. You can't be so worried about everybody else trying to see you. Once you see you, then the rest of that will come. It follows. But you got to start with you. Yep. Um, thank you so much for, thank you. for speaking with us. Yeah, thank you all for having me.